Good evening, everyone. I'm Joan Hanton, Vice President of College Relations for Olympic College, and I am standing in for Dr. David Mitchell tonight, who's at a state meeting. Um, he sends his regrets. This is one of his favorite events of the year, so, uh, but unfortunately he had a conflict. I want to thank our associated students for taking the initiative to create this forum for our students to meet and interact with our state legislators. <laughs> and I want to thank our state legislators for taking the time to come to our campus and engage with our college community. We are fortunate to live in a community where we enjoy such strong legislative support for higher education. And thanks to the hard work and dedication of our elected officials present tonight, Olympic College was able to keep our state funding at its current level this year and avoid any cuts to our operating budget, as well as they did not allow any tuition increases. So this is a win-win for Olympic College and for our students, and we thank all of you present tonight for that. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Margarita, our ASOC president, to start tonight's program. Hello, everyone. And I would like to thank our legislators for coming tonight. Thank you so much. On behalf of the Associated Students of Olympic College, I'd like to welcome you all to our Legislative Forum. My name is Margarita Mashkina and I'm proud to be served as President of the Associated Students of Olympic College. We are sponsoring tonight's Legislative Forum. We hope this will be a great way for the OC community to get to, get to know our legislators and for our legislators to get to know us, our issues and needs, and us as individuals. Uh, this evening will begin with several speakers from Olympic College. Then each legislator will present <coughs> brief statements. At the conclusion of their statements, then you, the audience, are welcome to ask questions uh, of the legislators. You can either ask it by directly coming up to the microphone, you can see the podium here, or if you'd prefer by writing a question on one of the cards, you can see cards on the table, and uh, which one uh, of our Olympic College, uh, our SOC officers can collect. If you need a card too, you can ask, you can get a card and write down your question. Since the legislative forum is being recorded, we do ask that you use the microphone if you ask a question or make a comment, so you can be heard clearly. As you look at the screen, you will notice uh, a big red square. Some of you may ask what it means, and it literally signifies squared in depth. Uh, this red square is a symbol of the red square student movement. It took place in Canada in 2012. In March 2011, the Canadian government announced an increase of tuition to 75% in five years. And, um, which ultimately drove students to strike. The result of this protest was the election of government. The new government forfeited the previous tuition hike. This movement proves that students have real power when common interests are involved. By wearing this square, I wear this too, and you can see that some people around you wear this square tonight. Uh, you demonstrating and standing for the needs and struggles of an average student and against the tuition increase. Moving on, I would like to introduce adjunct instructor Jack Lomi. He has a presentation.
My name is Jack Longmate. I've been an adjunct or part-time faculty uh, member here at OC since 1992. Uh, at OC, from the OC webpage, we have 118 full-time faculty members and over 300 part-time faculty members. Certainly, part-time faculty members are integral to the delivery of education here at OC as well as across the state. There's a number of differences between full and part-time faculty, but two of the primary differences are job security and pay. I uh, hope you can see that. Um, this is a portion of my quarterly contract. You'll see that I'm paid around $3,100 per class. I'm teaching two classes, so I'm getting around uh, $6,200 per quarter. And that constitutes 66% of a full-time teaching load. Rest assured that uh, that is not 66% of the pay. It's much, much discounted. In 2010, I taught a total of seven five-credit classes, and my annual income was just short of $22,000. $22,000 is not a family wage income. And you might think, well, why don't you teach more if you need more money? Well, adjunct instructors here at Olympic College, as is the case in most colleges around the state, are limited by a cap. That is, we can't teach above 85% of a full-time load. And a question for trustees and legislators is this. What lessons are being taught to aspiring young academics or professionals when they realize that their foundational courses are being delivered by people who earn what they did at their summer jobs. Well, what about full-time faculty? Well, from our collective bargaining agreement, the full-time faculty salary schedule begins at around $37,000 per year and tops out at just short of $65,000 a year, presuming a PhD and 25 years of service. This happens to be a page showing the, the full-time earnings of one Olympic College full-time member. You'll note that it's $106,000. How could that be, you might ask? If the uppermost part of the salary schedule is $65,000, how could this person be earning $106,000? There's got to be something wrong. Well, the answer is teaching overloads or moonlighting or courses in addition to the full-time load that this uh, instructor has. Um, Presuming that this person is at the topmost part of the salary uh, schedule at $65,000, that $106,000 subtracted by uh, that earning means that he must have earned in the neighborhood of $40,000 in addition from moonlighting. He's not the only full-time faculty member to teach above the full-time uh, level. Here's another who happens to have earned $109,000 or gained $44,000 as overtime or moonlighting. Another gained $45,000. In fact, of the 124 full-time faculty members at Olympic College in 2010, 67 of them, their annual earnings exceeded the topmost point on the salary scale. It should be very little surprise, therefore, why full-time faculty and their unions have not fought very hard for part-time faculty job security. Job security or job protection for part-time faculty would interfere with the ability of full-time faculty to teach additional courses um, at will. Job security for part-time faculty and moonlining for, for full-time faculty constitute a square conflict of interest. If there's a conflict over workload between the Teamsters and the Longshoremen, it can be, you know, a rough dispute. But in this case, the dispute is between members of the same union, which leads me to what I would like to request of the legislators here tonight. That is your consideration in supporting Senate Bill 5844, sponsored by Shelton, Senator Tim Sheldon, and Auburn Senator Pam Roach. This bill would change state law to allow part-time community and technical college faculty to form their own union. Now that is prohibited by state law. 
This bill is premised on the principle that a collective bargaining unit is and ought to be composed of workers who share a, com a community of interest and common working conditions relative to job security, compensation, workload, opportunities for advancement. It also is premised in recognition of the, in a two-tier workforce structure as we have in this state, where the upper tier may exercise real or perceived supervisory or managerial functions over the lower tier. A dynamic results that may negatively influence both the individuals and the collective bargaining process and may induce, among individuals of the lower tier, a desire to align with the interests of the upper tier, even when that alignment is counter to their own interests. Uh, with that, I'll conclude, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me some time on your agenda this evening. Um, my name is Dr. Jody Carson, and I'm the director of the Mathematics, Engineering, Science Achievement Program, or MESA program, here at Olympic College. The MESA program was introduced on this campus in June of 2011 as a pilot initiative sponsored by the National Science Foundation and involving five other community colleges in the state, the University of Washington, and Washington State University. MESA offers a dedicated student center and a comprehensive set of student services intended to attract students who have not traditionally considered STEM-related fields, including underrepresented and underserved students, retain those students during their first two to three years of college, and then facilitate their successful transfer onto a four-year institution. In just two years, the Olympic College Mesa program has more than doubled its enrollment from 33 students in 2012 to 83 students in 2013, demonstrating a strong student demand, and we're continuing to grow um, this year. Um, it has also effectively reached the right audiences. 64% um, of Mesa students are female, compared to 54% campus-wide. 41% are students of color, compared to 29% campus-wide. 68% of Mesa students are first-generation college students. Um, and 67% report financial need. Perhaps most noteworthy, however, is Mesa's impact on student achievement. I wish that I had time this evening to really share with you all of those individual and often life-changing student accomplishments um, that really best describe the value of the Mesa program. But we have five minutes. So in the interest of brevity, I'm going to just share with you um, some of the aggregate outcomes that we've seen for in, in that regard. Based on preliminary data, and again, we were initiated in 2011, so based on preliminary data and compared to non-MESA STEM peers, um, OC MESA students are showing higher persistence rates, higher completion rates, um, in terms of their two-year degree, and nearly four times the average annual momentum points earned by students, demonstrating effective and efficient progress towards their, towards their education, um, towards their educational goals. So this has been accomplished with a pretty modest $55,000 per year per campus budget. Now for the bad news. Um, funding for the MESA program ends at the end of this academic year um, with no confirmed funding for continuance. The State Board for Community and Technical Colleges has included funding uh, in their 2014 Supplemental Operating Budget Request uh, that would extend statewide operation of the MESA program for an additional year through the end of the biennium. Um, at well, near the $55,000 per campus uh, level. 
So the total request right now that's included in the SBCTC um, operating budget supplement is $410,000 for six campuses. Um, given the success of the program and its um, observed contribution to student achievement, I just wanted to make you all aware that this request is, is in the SBCTC budget and ask for any support that you can offer in ensuring that it remains in that budget request. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. At this point, I would like to introduce Chris Tucker. Thank you, Margarita. First, I'd like to thank a uh, ASOC for sponsoring the event again this year. It's uh, always a nice event, um, and I'd like to thank our legislator, legislators for being here. Um, last year, you um, had the institutional support, or support revenue, which for OC was about $590,000, and um, that helped our budget immensely, so we appreciate the, the work that the legislature is doing in times, difficult times. Um, I'm on a school board as well, so I understand uh, with the, the difficult budgeting uh, times we have. Um, these funds, the institutional support revenue, was to offset the lack of tuition increase. And I'm not advocating and I'm not asking for a tuition increase. I think we have to be very careful uh, with that so we don't outprice education for our students. Uh, but if there's no education, or no, excuse me, no tuition increase this year and we don't have it's, uh, the institutional support revenue, uh, I'm afraid that we're going to have to do some more cuts in our budget and we can't maintain a good quality education for our students if we're always cutting. So I would really encourage the legislature to provide the additional revenue again this year as you did last year. Currently the Association of Higher Education and the administration are involved in negotiations and uh, I don't want this to be a debate with Mr. Longmeet, but I believe that the AHE has addressed issues uh, in the past and we are doing so currently to benefit our adjunct faculty and that includes job security. Um, I acknowledge that adjunct pay is less than optimal and it would be beneficial for our adjunct to be paid uh, wages that they can live with. Um, <laughs> the, um, we do have some faculty issues. Uh, research shows that increasing full-time faculty improves student, student outcomes and student success. I don't, I'm not discounting the sound and strong work that our adjunct faculty do for our students and do for our college. They are an integral part of our, of our uh, educational system at Olympic College and across the state. But in order to attract and retain qualified faculty members, including part-time faculty members, we need to offer competitive salaries. So our focus this year uh, is going to be restoration of the COLA and higher education is joining uh, K-12 in that focus. We would encourage the legislature to pass House Bill 1348, which is the ability to bargain for local funds. Uh, college, uh, this community and technical college faculty are the only educational group in the state who cannot bargain for local money. K-12 certificated and classified uh, uh, employees can. Um, community and technical college classified staff can. And university uh, faculty and uh, uh, classified staff can as well. The third issue that we have is full funding of increments. And we would appreciate uh, the support of the legislature in um, fully funding increments for faculty salary increases. And reliance on turnover savings is unrealistic uh, for, for this purpose. In addition, uh, we have the Air Washington grant and we have three faculty members and staff members, other staff members who depend on this grant for their employment and so do our students. Um, so I would ask that the uh, legislature continue to support the Air Washington grant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, 
Now I would like to talk about students' perspective. That's why I'm here. Um, as everyone knows, the biggest challenge of students is paying for their education. I want to thank the legislators for making, uh, for making it possible for our generation to succeed. Facts have shown that Washington State tuition rates have not increased drastically, and they didn't increase. And it's a difficult task to keep tuition rates consistent with the everyday economic challenges. And it's even more difficult to lower tuition rates. However, by continuing to maintain the current tuition cost, it allows students to build a solid foundation for their future. In addition to the tuition issue, there are other factors that challenge students financially, such as increasing book and supply costs. The average book costs uh, a student 100 to 200 dollars, and used books, which are more much cheaper, not always available. Also, unexpected expenses such as outdated textbooks, which need to be replaced by the latest edition required by the college, present added stress. Can we find a rational solution? to the excessive cost of books that they change so frequently. By providing a more inviting atmosphere on campus, we foster a reputation that appeals to each demographic group and allows students to feel welcome and valued. One way to generate a more comfortable atmosphere on campus is to add more diversity among staff and faculty. Students who see the same ethnicities are willing to succeed academically and be involved with student life activities and leadership. Further providing resources to expand tutoring and counseling services among the entire student body, leaving nobody behind, upholds our constant support for students. A healthy balance is essential to any successful student. Having an accessible and updated wellness center is vital to achieving this. Our current building is in a desperate need for rebuilding. The greatest obstacle is finding a source to pay the expenses. For example, if we offer to add a $50 quarterly fee um, to help raise enough funds for the development of a future wellness center, students won't see the meaning of the investment because most of students won't see the results. And it will take around uh, three years to get enough money for this building. How do they approach this complicated project? These are the current issues that students have expressed around campus, and uh, there is no problem that cannot be solved without the right amount of effort. Thank you. Now we're expecting to hear from our legislators. We would like to begin from Senator Christine Olfas. So that's the area that, that Drew and I both represent. I've been in the legislature seven years. I served five in the House, and I'm on my second year in the Senate. And I have, for that seven-year period, consistently served on committees that address transportation, education, K-12 education, and natural resource and environmental issues. So those are the three topical areas that I really focus my efforts on when I'm in Olympia. Um, as well, I work on, um, I serve on um, different Senate and House joint committees or task forces um, specifically related to veterans and military affairs, which is key for the area that I serve. Um, so I'm really here um, to listen to what the concerns are and take questions. Usually when we have these forums, I learn a lot about what's going on on the campus. I feel like I've been a good partner in the faculty salary debates, whether it's adjunct or full time. And um, you know, the the reality of the salary issue for Olympic College is that 
your structure is different than a lot of other community colleges around the state. So other legislators just don't get what we're talking about. And that's a political kind of advocacy issue um, that we've kind of found insurmountable at this point. So your idea, Jack, of separating the bargaining units is kind of an interesting one because that would get some people's attention. The um, other thing I wanted to say was I've been serving during the course of the recession, and I know I sat over there at one of these forums while we cut billions of dollars out of the budget, including out of our community college and four-year college system, and it was awful. So this year was the first year in four years, I think, that we didn't take a hatchet to the state budget. And so it's, you know, it, it feels really good for those of us involved to say we didn't cut anything and we didn't raise tuition because over the last few years it's been bloody um, what we've done with, with the state budget. So I'm glad we got to a place of stability and the goal, of course, is to con continue reinvesting in not just K-12 and early childhood learning, but all the way up for the two-year colleges and the four-year colleges. So that's the goal for me, and I think it's a goal of the majority of legislators at this point. So hopefully happy year days are ahead of us for the next few years, and we'll keep moving on in a good partnership, and I look forward to the questions. Mr. Hanson. We're very obedient legislators. We wait until we're called upon. <laughs> I'm Drew Hanson with Senator Office. I represent the 23rd Legislative District. It is great to be back here at Olympic College. Uh, I spent many happy years on the Olympic College Foundation uh, under the astute leadership of Dr. John Hanson. So, which was neat. I mean, it was really an incredible experience. I was on the scholarship committee for a few years, and man, I mean, you read a few dozen of those essays from young people for whom 300 bucks from the foundation is the difference between going on to higher education and not doing it. And that is, and that is a sobering experience. And I think that's one reason I'm a pretty fervent advocate for the higher education system, particularly in the community and technical college system. So let me, I had some remarks that I'm not going to give you. Instead, I'm going to try to remember everyone's remarks who opened tonight and address them in reverse order of the grown-up speakers and then the student speaker, who's also a grown-up but also a student, uh, at the very end. So let me let me begin, uh, Chris, with your bill. That is, there was a bill mentioned, it's House Bill 1348, just for those of you who have forgotten, it gives community and technical college faculty the ability to bargain for local money. That is a bill that has to have. I was happy to vote for it. I'll be happy to vote for it again. Uh, we may have some problems in the Senate, as we did this year, but no, I, mean, I completely support that policy. I think it's a smart thing to do. So now going in reverse order to the MESA program, I'm really happy to hear about that. I have not known anything about it. I'd be fascinated to see if there would be a way to run a randomized control trial of MESA cohort students versus non-MESA cohort students and get some just incredibly robust data to support that. Having said that, uh, already Marty Brown, the director of the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges, is obviously wants to make a big, strong ask for it. And even the non-gold standard data you all have is awfully compelling. So I'd be very happy to support that when it comes before us, which is going to be, I hope, soon. So now, finally, in reverse order to the question about adjunct faculty, this is a tougher one. I mean, the bill that you had mentioned, I was, I was down there actually not checking my emails, but Googling it to see what happened to it. It didn't get a hearing in the Senate. I think that's because it was introduced a little bit too late, or at least that Senator Rolfe's more sage advice to me about why it didn't get a hearing. It's interesting. I mean, conceptually, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's a tricky problem, though, right? Because adjunct faculty, no matter where they are, don't make much money. I was an adjunct lecturer at UW Law School. I was you know, I, I don't think they call us adjunct, they call us like part-time lecturer. I made, I think, $2,000 for my course. And, you know, like that's, like, they do that because they can afford to do that. There's a virtually never-ending supply of people who want to be educators at the higher education level, particularly at the professional level. And so, like, this is, this is an issue, I think, that cuts across all of the higher education system. I don't think there's a lot of tremendously easy answers for like a, a major reshaping of the way that adjunct pay works. But maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I'm not I'm not professionally in this space. My knowledge is 
limited only by one time there. So now let me finish with uh, Stephen's remarks. Uh, this, I, I think you were quite rightly pointed out, the higher education system in general just needs more money to do well, right? I mean, we need more money so we don't have to raise tuition. We need more money so we can support the state need grant, which is right now not serving about 30,000 students who it would be serving, who are eligible if we put another $100 million into it. So the only real interesting and disputed question, because any legislator who's up here, no matter what party we belong to, is going to say we should fully support higher education, right? That's not controversial. The only interesting question is, well, how are you going to get the money to support higher education? And I think there are really only about three options. You can do reforms, like true reforms, where you try to do things smarter in state government that really save you money. Uh, to take your textbook example, we had a bill that we passed that encouraged online textbooks in high schools, which is about time, right? Because the textbooks are expensive, and they, you know, they they get revised every year, and they're terrible, right? So, like, clearly, one thing we should be doing is encouraging people to use online resources, and not incidentally, as a state, saving a bunch of money. That's a reform, all right? I mean, that's smart, good, forward-looking thinking. Those ideas are hard to find, and in Olympia, when you hear the word reform, nine times out of ten. It's just a code word for cutting people's pay. I mean, I don't mean to like put too fine a point on it, but like people say, let's reform our pension system. And you're like, huh, interesting. What do you mean by that? And they're like, well, people should pay more for their pensions. Like, That's just cutting somebody's pay. I mean, it's fine. If you want to cut somebody's pay, say you're going to cut somebody's pay. Just don't call it a reform in order to like put lipstick on the pig. I mean, it's just like not making any sense. So in any event, like the smart good reforms, we need lots of smart good reforms. The second way to do it is reductions elsewhere in the budget which is not popular and difficult when the Supreme Court has ordered us to spend well over a billion dollars per year more on the K-12 system than we are. And the third way to find the new money is with new revenue. And that's desperately unpopular. But I think everyone you have before you tonight has been on record several times saying that we should reduce or eliminate special interest tax loopholes to fully fund our schools. That's not, okay, we have a whistle. That might be popular in this room. That is not popular in the other room where we spend a lot of our time, the state capital in Olympia. To give you an idea of just how unpopular it is, in the House, we passed a bill that would have cut back $400 million of special interest tax loopholes to fund schools. Now, the Senate, which is controlled by a political party that I don't belong to, I... No, the coalition is... A coalition, a coalition. Uh, the Senate, in response, the Senate did not counter us, sort of meet us there and say, you know, great idea, we need to cut back these loopholes, we'll meet you at $400 million. How many people think what the Senate did is said, no problem, we'll meet you halfway, $200 million. Can you take us for $200 million? How about $100 million? $50 million? $1 million? $0.50? Cents? One penny? No, you're wrong, not even $0.50. Cents. How many people think the Senate agreed to close $0 million in tax loopholes? Okay. And it gets even worse. As a price of passing the budget, they insisted on a bill that opened up $10 million of new tax loopholes. So, I, I mean, I don't mean to put too fine a point on it, but that's literally how the budget negotiations went this year. And so I think it's a fight worth fighting to try to simplify and make our tax code fair and strip out the special interest preferences that don't actually create jobs and don't actually do any good, so we are actually able to fund our students, which is our state's by far most important asset. So thanks for having us today. Thank you, Representative Johansson, and I'll invite like to introduce Representative Kathy Hanks. Well, that's quite the act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm uh, Representative Kathy Hay. I um, am a veterinarian by profession. My husband and I, and now my son, have a veterinary clinic down in Shelton, Washington. I represent the 35th district that runs, oh, just uh, Marine View Drive and kind of out Newberry Hill, out to Seabeck, and then all of Mason County and then mostly trees and a few urban areas in the Olympia area. And it's a very diverse district. 
Um, it actually has people that attend at least three different community colleges and two different new uh, skill centers. I have over 16 school districts, and there's a lot more school buildings besides. Um, I have very conservative people in my district, and I have some very liberal people in my district, a few more liberal people in my district. But I've always said that I'm a person that can vote yes or no for just about anything, and half the people in my district are going to love me for it, and the other half are going to hate me. It doesn't really matter. So, I, you know, I have stayed very active and involved in education, and I know that the key to the success of school, whether you're talking preschool to, you know, senior projects to community colleges to what we're doing in higher education, engineering, and those things. It boils down to money. It always has. And in good times, we do better. But higher education, community colleges on up, are, have no protections by our Constitution. The people who are protected are the kids in the K-12 system. And we are struggling, but have finally really moved into believing that, oh, by the way, kindergarten kids are full-time learners and we need to fund them, as well as expanding early childhood because we know that if we can get, get together with the parents and the kids in those first five years of life, we can really set them on a path to success all the way through. It will make it so we can teach them at, at an advancing level rather than having to remediate and remediate. So, I have remained focused on education funding, and I don't really have to go over all the things that have happened. I have supported the, the uh, part-time faculty. I think we need to move as many of them as possible to full-time status, and I know there's, that's one way to do it. But we also have a community college system that is the envy of many other states and even other countries because of our ability for these institutions to really look at what are the demands, what are the needs of the students, and how do we get them through those first two years uh, after getting out of high school and being ready at the least cost. So, it, I mean, it's a great thing for the students. It's great because they're in our local communities. Uh, the ability to change and, and really address what are the needs of the students now moving forward but it comes at a cost, um, and that's an impact that is on, on your professors that do the, do the jobs of teaching every day. And, uh, you know, even high school and junior high teachers, they would like to get more pay, they have more, supposedly more stability in their jobs, but they are under tremendous scrutiny right now with um, teacher principal evaluations and the, fact that students are being tested and now those test results are going to be used to evaluate the teachers. There's, you know, there's some good stuff in there, but it's, it's difficult at the, at the K-12 level too. So addressing all of these issues is, um, it's a little bit mind boggling, but I enjoy the work. I've actually been doing this for 15 years. I'm going into my 16th year. And um, I bring a lot of experience and some of the things we've done right in the past and some of the things that we've done wrong. Um, but our community co college system is the right thing. And if we're going to make sure that every kid graduates from high school, then we got to have some place for them to go. And I think we all understand that. And the investment that we make in K-12 will lead into uh, greater investments in the community college system as well as articulation with the uh, beyond. I am very interested in technology. The STEM initiative is important, although I don't want to lose our focus on um, the music and the arts. And I really believe that they go together. I think some of the most creative people out there, if they are engineers, it's because they also are artistic and can imagine new way of doing things. And, and the youth and putting arts together with engineering is um, a great thing. And we'll, you know, I hope to really continue to support the arts, although the arts, even at the high school and junior high level, really have taken a hit because it wasn't that core funding for those core uh, courses. And uh, as money comes back, I hope we really uh, are able to develop that in, at the K-12 level, too. So those are some of the things I'm working on, 
And again, listening to you folks and what you bring forward, some of it I've heard before. Some of it has some new ideas. I hadn't heard about the senator's bill, and um, I'm sure it will run into some controversy, but I think it, it is something we do have to look at because you are in a very different situation than full-time faculty. On the other hand, you may pull numbers of people away from that other bargaining group. And I really believe that in the long run, the bargaining needs to happen, um, and we do have to change, work on making all of the institutions have more similarity because this, this program started a long time ago. Some of the newer ones don't live under the same rules when it comes to funding and that kind of thing. And then you have to remember, I have uh, also this little branch campus of the Olympic College, which we dearly love in Shelton, and yet we, we are very much at risk of losing that program. So that's another area that I have to really focus on, and I think they're doing some pretty good work to try to keep our program um, growing in Shelton area. So that's, that's me, and thank you very much. <laughs> And now we have time for questions from students. You can come up to the podium and ask your question or make comments. So I'm here, um, I'm here in Everly tonight to talk about more money and a topic that's like almost nuclear is what about money later? Because right now with student debt coming into the billions of dollars, it can take up to six months to get a job um, from starting the application process to actually landing that job. It can be six months. And also, if you're talking to students, I know someone who is denied their business license because of their student loans. So the student loan issue is something that most people I talk to are like, I don't want to touch it because it's, um, well, what um, one staffer told me was that you can't, reclaim the contents of someone's brain. So while there is bankruptcy law for everything else, student loan follows you to the grave. And, um, and that's because you say they can't reclaim it. And realistically, how much do they really reclaim in a lot of bankruptcy suits? So I was just wondering, is there ever gonna be movement on controlling you know, the student debt problem, giving students the opportunity to like actually get the job so they can pay their loans because I think most students want to pay their loans back but then they get into a situation where they're in default and their credit goes downhill and I think that's a situation with a lot of students that I've talked with is that they need time to actually get a job especially in the economy that we've been having and also you know recently with the Fannie Mae scandal of you know that they're paying lobbyists to keep student loans and no movement on the student loans. So I guess my question is, is it going to remain a nuclear topic that people just don't want to talk about and students are going to be crushed under their debt? Um, because sometimes the answer isn't necessarily more money, it's about letting people have money so they can pay it back. And time, giving people time, not necessarily more money. But. So I'm, I'm very interested in this issue. You know, I, as a veterinarian, I went to school and ended up coming out with a pretty good debt. At the time, it was only $12,000, um, but it was pretty overwhelming. It was a long time ago. But uh, it was a loan that was on, in, in a time when interest rates were at 13%. My loan was 3% for a student loan. And that's because it was a government-run loan, which our federal government walked away from a long time ago and is part of, a big part of the problem. And they gave me a year before I had to start paying on that loan. And then it took me 10 years to pay it off. But that was a good system. That was a fair system. And then when the federal government walked away from student loans in, in a very big way was when we really saw the debt load starting to mount on students. And, and I've looked at this issue for many years just because my kids, you know, they're both graduated now, but um, they, uh, many of their classmates came out with huge debts. And those are even professionals, those are veterinarians that um, can only get jobs for 50 or 60 thousand a year 
and their debt is over 200000 How are they ever going to be able to get going? So I do believe that if the state can begin to find a way to offset those debts by where you work or um, develop some sort of loan ability for students to have the time that you, that you spoke for, I'm, you know, they want to pay them back. But unless we find a way to, um, I think, have as low an interest rate as possible, delay and when they have to have the first payment and then a plan for a 30-year payment is uh, the only way many of our students, and it, like I said, it's, it's all through the system and it's been building for a long time. The federal government, in my opinion, the federal government should be stepping forward, especially for uh, students that have very high level degrees that you know, had to go to school for 10 years to get those degrees. And um, it, it's time um, to do it because uh, we do, we have a whole generation of students that, I, you know, I understand the stress that you are under and no hope for really ever getting from, out from under it. So, yes, I will be working on it and hopefully the federal government will be working on it too. Thank you for bringing this up. I, it makes it less nuclear every time somebody talks about it. So thank you for raising it tonight. Uh, <laughs> let's try this again. All right, good enough. Uh, so I think most of this problem, for better or for worse, is a federal one that we don't have a lot of ability at the state level to deal with. I mean, I'll tell you, if I ran the bankruptcy code, I'd make student loan debts dischargeable in bankruptcy in a second. Right? I mean, it makes no sense at all to me that some 19-year-old makes a bad financial decision, takes on a quite a bit of debt, and gets in over his or her head, and that sticks with you forever, where some 35-year-old takes out a dumb home equity loan, and that gets wiped out. I mean, I did, like, it just doesn't seem fair to me, right? But, like, but for better or for worse, I don't run the federal bankruptcy code. So, so with that in mind, here's what I think we can do at the state level. One is deal with it on the front end by shoving more money into the state need grant. If we shove more money into the state need grant, people are gonna take on less debt. That doesn't solve the problem that you're raising, which is people who get out now who already have the debt, but it at least prevents some of that problem from recurring in the future. That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, the example you mentioned of someone not getting a business license from student debt. If you wanna put them in touch with our office, I'm real easy to find, drew.hanson.wedge.law.gov, that sounds like a bill idea to me. Like, you know, that sounds like something, clearly we don't want student debt to stand as a barrier to people starting businesses, forming companies, actually like going forward in their lives. And if that's happening, maybe that's something we can do legislatively. I'd be very, very happy to look at that. And third, and this is where I think I'll part company slightly with my colleague from the 35th, there are clearly situations where students are taking debt that they had no business taking on in the first place. So, I mean, veterinarians probably shouldn't take on $200,000 in debt. I mean, not, I, mean I, I think there's an oversupply of veterinarians just in general, right? I have a friend who married, uh, <laughs> okay, paper press, not anywhere. Paper press, not anywhere. Press, not in Chelsea. Uh, but there's also, I mean, people who get, people who take on enormous loads of debt for degrees that have no or limited labor market value, that's just a dumb financial decision. And so we need to push that education in as many levels as we can to say, if you're gonna get a Master of Fine Arts in drawing, you shouldn't take on $150,000 in debt to get it. I don't think that happens a lot or all the time, but boy, it does happen from time to time. And those are, I think, the most crushing situations where you have someone with a degree that just isn't actually going to get you anywhere. So the more that we can do at the college level, just being real clear about what the career paths are and what the realistic salaries are, hopefully we can do something to prevent young people from going into career, from taking on debt that actually isn't going to repay in the long run. I feel badly for you because you're trapped there while yeah, we respond. Yeah, people think, sorry, we <laughs> To add to what these two have said though, you know, one change that is occurring is that people in general are starting to talk about student debt as an economic development issue. So when you have communities where young people have taken on such big loans that they can't afford to buy a house, they can't get a car, and they're starting their families later, that becomes a huge, um, that has a huge ripple effect across an entire community. So that, those economic discussions are just starting to happen, and I think that's going to really be a um, important weapon to use in this fight against student debt and um, 
really a bigger battle is about tuition costs and whether students are getting value for the tuition that they're paying. And that's a whole other discussion. There's no question about value at a community college. That's not the issue. Um, but a lot of the four-year schools and a lot of the private um, four-year schools, that's a ongoing debate that is people are just starting to have. Is that law degree worth $200,000 in debt when there are too many lawyers in the country? Yeah. So. <laughs> um, so you raise an issue that I don't think it's nuclear at all. I think the timing is perfect, and I think we're just starting to see um, the kind of the perfect storm of the situation that we're in right now with young people with huge amount of debt. Um, people are finally starting to get that that's not just a personal problem, that that's a whole community problem. Yeah, so I'm standing up here to hog the mic just for a few more seconds. So I want to put a good word in for Perkins funding and for the Pell Grant. Um, so if you know anybody who knows anybody, tell them that uh, Perkins funding is incredibly important to our school here. We've bought a lot of equipment to improve our engineering program and other things like that. So through that Perkins funding, we've been able to really expand what we can do at this college. And also through Pell Grants. Not everybody is a fan of this, but here at the school, because the tuition is low, people are able to live on Pell Grants. So they're able to have daycare for their children. They're able to make those gas costs. They're able to pay for books to be here. So the Pell Grants um, are extremely important to the students here because um, I don't know why it's not the positive thing that people get to live off those. They don't just have to eat it all, but, but I think it's fantastic. So if you know anybody who knows anybody and everybody, just put in a good word for those two things because they make a big difference here. Great. And again, those, yeah. again, those are federal. Um, those are federal programs. And, uh, I guess something Congress did right recently. <laughs> one thing, and a state need grant that they're talking about, not Pell Grants, but there, there is, you know, there is money that can be used to live on besides just buying books or paying for tuition. And every once in a while, and I just had a phone call from a woman, maybe you got it too, where her daughter is in school and her classmate or her roommates are both on state assistance and one of them, uh, you know, got her check and went out and bought $400 boots. And I don't, you know, I, I listen and I don't believe that's the right thing to do, but I am not willing to start listing out how you can use the money that you get. But it, there are personal decisions that students need to make. And, and they need to be responsible because when there are stories like that, one, one bad thing can negate a hundred good things that are done with your money. So as students, you've got to be, you know, be as smart as you can about how the money is spent. And um, because the stories do get back to us when parents are trying to put a couple kids through school and don't, aren't getting any help at all in the middle very middle class and, and kids that are coming from somewhere that they don't have money and not using it wisely is it's it's very hard. It's a it's a story that you hear and it's not a good thing. Uh, I have a question. More is uh, not necessarily at a community college level but at any college level. What do you feel about students being in college, being notified if there's a sexual predator in the school with you? Shouldn't that be something that everyone should know about? Why do I have to look it up each quarter to see if I have somebody new in school? So many. That's more of a state thing than a federal thing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Well, do don't, I think all Sexual predators have to have, there has to be something in the paper, there's a picture, there, there's, I mean, notifications are required um, where they're located. Now, if they're in the school, I, you know, I don't know, that would be something we would probably have to add to the, the language. No? It's in there? It's, it fell. 
I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we did. Val Tarns, I'm an adjunct instructor here. I've had the, um, that been informed uh, a couple of times. They only require to notify the students who are registering and the instructor when it's a level three, but less than that, it's not a requirement. So, um, and that way the students have the option to whether they were gonna be in the class or not. And at least the class that I was in, it didn't, wasn't an issue we had. Out of potential for 40 students, I had 35. So they may have lost a few, but you know, obviously there were you know, students who were willing to take the class. So, you know. So how did that notification happen? I got, I got an email, <laughs> which, um, and I, as I understand it, that when the students register for the class, they are told at that time. So they have the option to change right at that moment in time to take a different class if they want. But as an instructor, I was told just prior to the class starting that this student is a level three registered sex offender and that at any time we are, you know, security is always there and they're well aware of it and they actually, um, our head of security meets with each one of these people and talk about their uh, plan and they work very closely with the counselors and so they keep tabs on folks really well. So I never had a problem. Nobody else in the class expressed a problem. We did group work and uh, outside of class, and so that went along just fine. And at some other point, I want to bring up some other things about you guys need to be aware of that don't happen that do affect adjunct versus faculty, uh, full-time faculty. I was just going to tag on to that. I wish I had all the answers. I don't. But um, we are an open access community, um, so we do accept anybody who legally has the right to be here. Um, we do um, make notifications of level three sex offenders. We often send out notices to all, um, as well as we keep um, the statistics, uh, the, the information that we're giving from law enforcement on file in different places on the campuses, so you can go refer to photos and that information if that's a concern. Um, as Val said, we do do an intake with all sex offenders um, so that we know they are on campus. Um, of course, their intent is to be a, um, a valid member of our community, um, but that we have stay in contact with them um, and do the notifications in the classroom. My name is Jennifer Lynch and I'm a welding student here at Olympic College and I am low income and I get a lot of money through um, grant programs to get my school funding and last summer I couldn't attend my summer classes because of the budget crisis kind of thing going on in the legislator. My Patty Thomas, the lady in charge of the program was like, I don't know what's going on, we don't know when we're going to have word. It's stress, everyone's throwing it down in there, we don't know what's going on. And also I'm part of a BFET program that helps students with emergency tuition, books, and also being eligible for food stamps for certain trades like accountants, nursing program, welding. It really, really helps a lot of the students here. And I've noticed through time BFET has been cut tremendously. They don't do the emergency tuition anymore. They can't even afford to give books to students, so then they refer them to Patty Thomas for Sing, for rentable, reusable books. And we just get really scared here at the college because so many students that are low income, single parents, you know, lots of debt, like just trying to make it to that career to get us going in our lives. Like, we get scared when these things slowly disappear and we keep hearing from all the people on our end that, oh, well, you know, the budget's getting cut again, and they're, they're, it's all up to the representatives and senators, the future, to, you know, figure out budgets and fix the crisis. So I don't really understand how all that works. And, I mean, how aware of you guys are you of these programs slowly kind of dwindling down in the cuts? And is there any kind of, like, solution to maybe help reimburse these programs, make them grow, keep them going? I guess that's my question. Um, well, 
like Senator Rolfe has said, we've been through five years of basically cuts. And this year was the, probably the first year that we didn't have to cut. Um, there was actually more money coming in than we originally thought there was going to be. But for all kinds of reasons, uh, I can name one, um, that we didn't get done until the very end of June, which made it very hard for you to plan for a summer program. That's what that was about. Things are getting better, and um, we've written a two-year budget, and we think there's a little more money coming in, and if we do anything with the supplemental budget, I don't think it will be to cut anymore. I think it will be to begin to reinstate. We've cut things that we thought people weren't gonna die if it went. And like I said, higher education was a target, and actually funding for Higher education got cut by 30%, you know, each year for two or three years. It was just horrible. And we didn't really have any other choices. I, you know, the elephant in the room, and it is an elephant, um, <laughs> would be to talk about taxes. And as much as business hates business and operations tax, it is a way that then we're able to give business like 640 tax breaks. And they're significant amounts of money, billions of dollars by, well, we just did another one, I think, last Saturday for Boeing. And there were good reasons. Um, supposedly it will create jobs and boost our economy, but it was by giving a huge tax break to Boeing um, and begging them or, oh, yeah, begging them to stay in the state. And that's an important job, and probably if you're into welding, that's even more important. So we're trying to take the long view. Um, but understanding the needs of individual students, and especially women um, in uh, engineering, um, trying to get more women and students of color into some of those jobs that I think are gonna be really good strong living wage jobs is another focus that we have, and, and I think we will continue that. So um, carry on, keep working on it, get more involved and understand what uh, funding does come, but the grants and scholarships and the work that the foundation does here is, is really critical for students. You do have a great job, great program, and, and great opportunity with welding. That's, that's one that's not gonna go away, so. I think it's going to be okay. Don't give up. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just add on to that very briefly. First of all, good work on chasing that field. You're going to actually get a job, unlike all the idiots like me who went to become lawyers who are not going to get jobs, because there is an oversupply of lawyers, as a matter of fact. Uh, so this is so. I think. To answer your question directly, it is helpful for us to hear directly how cuts affect people. My guess, I don't know these specific crimes, my guess is they're not directly funded from the state, but are rather funded from the college, out of the money the state gives the college. Yeah, I think that's okay, how it so works. That's, you know, that's one of the consequences of cutting higher education. And so to Representative Hay's point, it is perfectly fair for you or any other constituent to say, I get that you would rather not cut, but what about these loopholes are sitting in the tax code? I mean, just like to give you, know, give you a, not to like harp on this, to give you one example, one of the tax loopholes that we voted to close was there's a special rate for travel agents in the tax code. If you're a service industry, so I'm a lawyer, I'm part owner of a law firm, I pay the business and occupations rate at 1.5%. Travel agents who are in the service industry, they're special, they don't have to pay that. They got a lobbyist to write them in a lower rate in the tax code some years ago. That lower rate cost the state a cool $30 million per biennium, okay? And you might have noticed, most travel agents, they're not mom and pop stores now. They're in Redmond, and they have names that rhyme with Schmuckspedia. So like, <laughs> you can guess where this money's actually going, okay? So it is perfectly fair 
for you and any other constituent to say, look, can we just be realistic and cut some of these suckers back so we can afford to fund colleges at a level that lets me pay my rent at the beginning of every month and lets me pay my bills so I don't get my power shut off? Is that really too much to ask? That is a perfectly fair question for you to ask your life. going to get up because I don't really have anything to add except to thank you and the other students that have come forward because it is really good to hear how, not just how the cuts impact you, but how the financial aid or the scholarships positively impacts you. So thank you. And then I have to say in my defense that while they keep slamming the Senate for not passing, <laughs> I'm in the minority in the Senate and I didn't get to decide that. She's not enough. Well, thank you guys for listening, and we really do appreciate you coming down here to, you know, hear the concerns of us. So thank you again. That's right. Do we have any more questions? Okay. Well, I'll just answer. Okay. Um, so I've heard a lot about uh, Mesh and STEM tonight. And so I'd like to know a little bit about what you guys are doing to support, as you mentioned earlier, the arts, you know, uh, programs that are taking a big cut right now, such as music, or even what people don't normally consider as arts would be like communications or something like that. So I want to know what you guys are doing, what steps you're taking to help keep those rolling forward. Do you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So, um, you know, well, one thing you can start with is there's been a huge focus in the state on STEM. And there are a good number of legislators who think it should be STEAM, which would include science, technology, art, engineering, and math. And uh, Governor Gregoire, years ago, had a report done on the state of education in this state and the direction we should be heading. And the first paragraph in that report said, our greatest asset is our state's creativity and our entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit. So... The idea of emphasizing the arts in the schools is absolutely something that we should be doing, whether it's in um, K-12 or in higher ed. And there are and there is a growing number of legislators that are talking about that. So we're on the right track with that. On a bigger level, the reason that you're seeing cuts to the arts is because there have been such massive cuts to education funding in general over the last four, uh, four or five years that the arts programs, because they're not mandated by the state, have been among the first to go in most school districts. Um, and so as we fund, as we provide more funding to the elementary, middle, and high schools in this state, the school boards and the principals will have more money to preserve the arts programs that are still there and possibly even expand them depending on student demand. So the key thing, I think, is a general understanding of the importance of the arts to our economy. And the second big, big issue is adequate funding for K-12 education, which is what our state constitution mandates, and it's something the legislature has fallen down on for 20 years. So th I think those are the two big um, ways to tackle it. And I'll just add something real quick. I mean, Senator Rollins is absolutely right. This is basically a district-level decision in most instances. It will provide the money, but we don't we don't give a mandate like an X amount of amount of money goes for art, X amount of money goes for the debate team, uh, whatever. So you talk to Mr. Stone your colleagues in the district uh, at that one. But I do think one of the <laughs> I do think one of the things we do do at the state level that is productive for the arts is we are now putting into play a second required arts credit to graduate from high school as part of the core twenty four the new graduation initiatives. And that is very for all the reasons everyone's mentioned. I mean, I think, I think the higher up you get in terms of levels in the educational system, the less persuasive the case for the arts becomes. Like, you know, ending up at about the master's in fine arts level or the PhD in fine arts level, that's a pretty tough case to make, right, from a labor market perspective. But in the K through 12 system, it's a foundational skill for everything in ways we don't even know, right? Because it, I mean, it teaches you all sorts of things you're never even going to know you can taught. So that's a huge thing for us as a state to put that second credit in, maintain that second credit. Uh, so, you know, I think that to the extent we are doing anything, I think that's a pretty good and productive step forward. Um, Oh, I, I would just 
say, let's see, I paint, I sing, I play piano, I play uh, trombone in a swing band, I play guitar, I sing, and yet I'm a veterinarian. So, I mean, I had to take science courses, academically very challenging, and the only way I made it through those really tough times was to be able to have a little time to play the piano, a little bit of time to sing in a choir, um, and I know the value of that at, at a really deep level, but my school, my high school, my church had great music programs and art programs. I never would have graduated from high school if I hadn't had art class to hang out in. It was sanity for me. So I know the value. I do believe that the art education community must really move forward, and it isn't just pictures on the wall, but it's really developing the whole mind, the whole body. Dance, I, you know, I'm a dancer, I love dancing. And so putting all of those things together to create a whole, um, a whole person that can really address kind of all kinds of challenges, that can look at problems and be problem solvers, and creativity, and we know that's what the arts are really about. So expression, personal expression, how you get through, you know, some of the most disturbed people made it through life because they could paint and they could express themselves. And so that mental health is a big part of it. It's right there. We have to work as instructors, as legislators, as families, as churches, to remember how important the arts are to us and to the future. So if you're an artist and you want to help do this, be sure to connect it to all of the world and to the sciences and technology as well. It's all there. And um, designing some great cars, I remember doing that. So maybe airplanes too. So bring the arts into everything that you do. Every class should have some artistic uh, background, some artistic history, and blending of what we're trying to teach can really connect to more of the students in the classroom. So, um, we're trying to help our teachers to be more diverse, to work in teams, and to bring all of those fields together to really learn things at a deeper level. And it's pretty exciting work going on, and the arts have got to be there. We know it. You know, be before we leave the topic of the arts, I love that you're, like, taking notes. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm with the Olympian of Olympic College, so I'm a <laughs> reporter. So okay. Ah, I thought we were so interested. <laughs> Um, before we leave the topic of the arts, though, I want to point out something. There, um, there's a really, really dynamic arts education teacher in the North Kitsap School District. He teaches at Kingston High School. And he said to me seven or eight years ago something that I've never forgotten. So I want to say it to you all. Look around the room. So look at the lights. Look at the color of the lights, the design of the lights, the length of the lights. Look at how the lights um, project light all around this room. Look at how they fit in with the paint of the walls. Look at this, the, the curve of these walls. Look at the pattern on the carpet. Everything around us is designed by somebody who has an arts background. And so, um, as Kathy said, the arts are important to just kind of your, your well-being as a human, but they're also really key components of our economy. And artistic talent and artistic ability isn't something that you can ship overseas. It's homegrown Washington state talent. And you can't hire somebody in another country to envision the design of this room. You need somebody who can walk, an interior designer who can walk in the room and get all excited about it and, and draw things and hire people to help them. So it's a really, Every aspect of our lives is influenced by art, even when we don't even notice it. So on that note, <laughs> uh, everything you said, Kathy, about getting our educators to work towards blended sort of experiences for our students, to be more holistic, have life learning skills, which anyone who practices art knows exactly what they are. And you know, one thing that was said was that these are not tangible. They're not things we really know we've learned, but we do. And um, so while you are asking us to um, try and become the educators that really include the arts, um, I want to say that at Olympic College, I think we're already doing it. We're waiting for you to give us a building. 
because that building uh -huh. is our laboratory. It is our best practices. It is where the Mesa students can come and exercise and explore their ideas. And it's where our uh, political science students can come and set up on stage and do some sort of mock improv in politics. And that is exactly the one key missing to a holistic experience. And we here at Olympic College are already practicing it. And, you know, Senator Rolfus just came and saw our whale. And so that was welding, that was marine science, it was the, the student clubs of environmental club. I mean, all of us work together. And it has an environmental impact. So um, coming up in February, the Collective Visions, I'm actually going to be um, doing the moderating of a panel on art and a healthy community. And we're going to have the mental, physical, the economic, um, and the that all of the holistic aspects of how art can help a community be whole. And Steve Jobs, was he an engineer or a creative thinker first? You know? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm wondering from each of you, where do you stand on getting us our building ASAP? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great idea. We have built the building you're on the list and moving up and that kind of thing, it, it will happen. It's a sustained effort for buildings, especially on campuses. Yeah. Um, I will tell you, though, that funding is, as always, a challenge. And, and if there's one problem we have in this society with the arts is unless you really pop out, you know, at some really high level, there's not a whole lot of economy. Um, I have a son who graduated from Evergreen with a music technology degree. Oh, cool. yeah, he's pouring beer at the East Side Bar. <laughs> but he's still creating. He's, you know, who knows, maybe something will happen with it. But that is the challenge that, you know, if you're looking at a building that's going to do science, technology, engineering, math, and then an arts building, at this point, at the legislative level, it is sometimes hard say this is just as important as that. You know that, but it's still harder. So the persuasion. But we, yeah, persuasion, but showing these kind of things, doing this kind of work will make a big difference. And I'm sure if it's on the list, it will eventually move to the top. So the, sooner, hopefully, rather than later. <laughs> the way the state the way the state funds community college um, buildings is really I think it's really interesting. It's a good model for other programs. The, the community colleges all get together and they prioritize their list mm -hmm. and they take turns. So if your building is on OC's list, it will get built um, as we design. provide the funding. <laughs> yeah. it's the so it's not about us getting an earmark or lobbying mm -hmm. or you lobbying for it. We're just working our way down the statewide list. Okay. Yeah, and when I showed up, which is only about two years ago, I was already to jump down when I started. I come from the OC Foundation for I was like, come on, man, we need our stuff. <laughs> Dr. Mitchell and everyone else to their credit are like, there is a process, it's reasonable, respect the list, respect the process. So I think that's the answer. Well, I, and, I, and I will add this. Um, I am currently working on a class that is art as therapy. And I'm hoping it would um, not just be about art and the student is going to transfer to the BFA and the MFA, but this is going to allow Olympic College to address art as, a, as therapy for our other demographic, the veterans and for physical disabilities. So I'm hoping that this new building actually allows us to give that kind of training um, in addition to, you know, being a, for me. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> I want, to, I I want like to make a reminder that it's almost 7.30 and we have time for one or two more questions. Okay, can I just add one thing about the building? We are at the top of the list for OC for a new building. Um, however, I heard at a meeting recently, actually this week, that there, the state is talking about cutting the building down in size because of a variety of reasons. One reason is because we have too much square footage for classrooms already, which I find hard to believe. We've got, we may have a lot of classrooms, but we have classrooms that a, a, a faculty member has to walk through an active class to get into their office. Or we have a, a classroom where we may have 20 students in a classroom that holds 18 students. Or the equipment in the classroom is inadequate to provide a, a sound education to students. So I'm ho I hope that that information will get to whoever the state is and they can decide that um, 
you know, this is an important building. We do need the building. And granted, we've had a couple new buildings, but we're a, we're a college that has been neglected for buildings for a long, long time. Let Thank us you. check into that. I don't think that people are quite aware of. It's, um, I know there's lots of money that poured into programs, and I think it's wonderful. I benefit greatly. Um, however, a lot of them are given out by, um, it, it's because of age. For example, if you're under 24, um, your parents' income is considered as your income, and you're basically told that you, your parents expect you to be able to pay 20, over $20,000 a year for your your um, living and education costs. In many cases, children whose parents have these graduate degrees and these jobs have their own student loan still. They're paying. I, I can't tell you how many people I know, including myself, who spent many years of their life trying to fund their own education and working five jobs and would have done anything to have the handout that some people get a, that qualify for the low income that in many cases don't even notice that they qualify for or aren't stepping forward to, to actually know that they've received it. Uh, in many cases, uh, and I know this is a federal issue, but um, uh, work study grants are given out to students. Many students don't even look at their email to know that they have been given this money, so that this money is being given out and they don't even know they have it. Um, and then, uh, so I want our state, I guess, to kind of try to help meet that need, the need of students who are willing to work and put forward the effort to have the funds available that our federal government makes it completely unavailable. They can't even look at it. They don't even know that they could wait till they're 24 and all of a sudden everything will be paid for. Instead, they're taking out all of these loans. Nobody knows about this issue about the middle class disappearing because because everyone gets this money and they or they take out these student loans, but then you just you make this line and all of a sudden everything's paid for. Everything's forgiven. But if you don't wait, or on the other hand, and then something else is I know that um, service service corps have been dropped from the federal government on the entire service uh, veterans corps, um, Maricor National Civilian Community Corps, Maricor Vista, all these programs have been cut. I know that that Washington State still has an AmeriCorps pr program, and I want to encourage them to continue to have an AmeriCorps program, which is giving the students um, scholarship funds. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Hello. Uh, I just had a quick question. Uh, I got denied financial aid uh, a couple times before I turned 26 because they said my dad was still my uh, dependent, so he made too much. Um, so they denied me financial aid, so when, when I turned 26, I was re-eligible for it. Um, but they denied me once again, they denied my claim for all of 2000. Now 2013 is when I came here, and they denied me because I made too much in 2012, is what they said. So I have to reapply in 2014. Uh, I made 18, I, I worked part-time at a casino as a blackjack dealer. Um, I only made eighteen thousand, um, less than twenty thousand dollars, and they said that was too much. And I want to know how eighteen thousand dollars a year is too much uh, to be eligible for financial aid. So I'm guessing I can't talk about what the federal guidelines are. I'm guessing a lot of this is federal. At the state level, you definitely. I think you'd be eligible for the state aid grant slam dunk. I mean, it goes up to 70% of the median income, which for family of four is like $57,000. So, I mean, I think that's an avenue, you know, that's a trap to run if you haven't run it already. See if the state aid grant can come in there and backfill something. The federal stuff, I'm sorry, I just don't have the knowledge on one way or another. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of things. We're dealing with pay with for the adjuncts versus the uh, full time. One of the things that came up, and it happened to me personally. This is why I'm bringing it because I think it's something that a lot of people didn't seem to know, is that as an adjunct, the only way I can meet my 50% or more to get benefits is I have to teach. 
I cannot be given another job on campus at what they would call a, a one-third release time and get credit as, as a teaching component. So like this quarter, I only have one class because the other one didn't go. For those of you, I will make a pitch. I teach state and local government. If you want to know what these people do, you need to sign up for my class. We couldn't get it go, not enough people signed up. Anyway, so, um, I, but I am doing something on behalf of OC that is equivalent to a one-third load. One-third, one-third is two-thirds. That gives you the 66%. I cannot get my benefits because this one-third is not a teaching. It is for the full-time. It's considered a full-time one-third release. But as an adjunct, I don't get that. That's an inequity that needs to be fixed. And that is, as I understand it, is state legislation. So I want my money. <laughs> I want my benefits. I usually my money. I want my benefits. Because um, I know that I can't possibly be the only one that's been in that position. Uh, the other thing is, this is one of those things where um, the legislature can pull its little fingers off in that um, on a committee where we're trying to come up with a, uh, to, we're using a pilot program on called Turnitin, which deals with the issues around plagiarism and it's a, it's a tool to use to teach students how not to plagiarize, how to give you know appropriate credit. But one of the things about this is that um, in this process we need to, we had to look at our uh, academic honesty and integrity policy and see if we want to make changes. That was the intent to see what, you know, how to put this all together. Well, it turns out that every community college and technical college, if not all the higher eds, have their own piece of the whack on that issue. So if we want to change any of that, we have to go to you to change it. That makes no sense <laughs> that a, 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 a school policy should be immortalized in a whack. So I, I, I figured you guys that was not you're yeah, unaware yeah. about that. Could you kind of figure that one out. One would think there might just be a statewide general policy, and everybody can then do their appropriate stuff right. for their own institution. So yeah, um, that makes sense. that's you know yeah. those are right now. Those are the two things that you know I think you guys can handle easily. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> This is the last question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sonia Jensen, and I have been an OC uh, student now for. Not quite my mind. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. My name is Sonia Jensen. I have been an OC student for the last two years here. Um, I am 40 something years old. I have grandchildren. Um, I also have a um, extremely rare disability that. Um, I was told I would never be able to work again, and I entered into the photography department. The photography department is almost gone now, and in doing so, in, my, in the two years that I have been here, um, I, I'm very social. I speak to quite a few people. Um, I, I've been raised in a family of lawyers, politicians, and military, um, and I understand well how the system works. Um, and one thing, um, and somebody had mentioned earlier, and I'm sorry I didn't, about how we needed to bring in the arts in this form, in this format, because there's so many students in in OC now that are do not know which way to go, and and, and I'm not just saying photography in and of itself, media, communications, all of these things are extremely important but they're being cut out. And students are actually leaving OC right now. I can name 10 students that are leaving OC to go to different colleges because the program has been cut. So many of these programs that are so vital. And people look at photography say, hey, you know, what are you gonna do with it? But, you know, I'm somebody that, I, I, ha I have a degree already. I used to own my own business. I no longer am allowed to, can do that because of my health issues. You know, so this is something that I can pursue, but it's being cut. I don't have many options left. You know, I live in Gig Harbor. I, I don't want to have to go over the bridge. I don't want to have to go to Seattle. 
I want to stay in, in this area. I want to be able to continue in this area. And so many of the students here desperately want this program to continue on. And I'm sure anybody that's aware knows what a picture does, regardless if it's a photojournalistic picture or whether it's a picture of a flower or of a boat or of all of you sitting there which, by the way, will be posted on our OC website, <laughs> our photography <laughs> website, just so you know, <laughs> which is a good thing. But um, I guess it's my, my I, 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 I'm not understanding why these are, the, these are going away. When they, when they help people that do have disabilities, help people, and so much is unknown about the mental aspects of how it works, and that's one thing, when it comes to the body and with the disease I have, I understand extremely well. Um, and so it's, I listen to them, I hear them, and they're lost because they're, they're, they're being forced to go into these, um, to, to, to engineering and programs that they really fully do not understand. And so they need another, another route to go and, and incorporating them. And like you said, sure, you can't just have a music um, playing a, I'm just going to say trauma, okay, as a, this is an example, please, and, and, and go out and necessarily get a job playing a trombone. Um, you need to, to incorporate public speaking. Um, you need to incorporate the communications with the multicultural communications, which is so important. Um, we need to incorporate all of these things together, but yet we're losing probably one of, one of the greatest programs there are, which is the photography department. And it's not just photography, it's photojournalism. It's learning how to work in a newspaper. It's learning how to communicate with people. It's learning how to communicate with those that don't know how to communicate with people because they can do this through a camera lens. Um, students will actually come now um, to us and say, hey, you know, could you show me, because I have anxiety, I, I really don't know how to speak with somebody, So, but I want to take pictures or I want to learn how to put what I'm seeing, which is not necessarily what all of you are seeing, put it out there. And they don't have these options anymore. It, it, they're, they're, it's going away. And I, I just can't, I mean, I, and I've been keeping, and I keep, last, for the last two years I've been keeping record, literally with my photography, of all, everything that's been going on on campus. And it, and it amazes me the, the wonderful things that happen in OC, the, the changes that have happened in OC, but yet some of the most important, vital things that people just don't consider worthy are being cut and being destroyed. Yet we need, that said it, we need to be able to. I reminded that you would keep your segment up to five minutes. Up to it's, five minutes? It was more than five minutes, I guess. Oh, modified? Yeah. Yes, okay. I, I'm just getting carried away because I'm very passionate about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and I, and my, I'm, I'm just at a loss, though, is if we keep focusing on strictly what is engineering or what is this, and they're all important, and if we take away the arts or if we don't incorporate them, it doesn't help the mental disability because we need that mental stability that goes with the physical. The physical and the mental are always together. We're losing sight of that as a whole. Uh, I think we can just see that. Watch it in White House. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. You all have a wonderful night.